From athletes to authors, entertainers to innovators, we connect with those who help shape our culture. Join us in revealing stories of their lives and backgrounds, their triumphs and tragedies that molded them into who they are today. Authentically off script and personally illuminating, this is Audibles with Jason Scarborough. This week on Audible, Chip Henderson. So Winona, Mississippi, that's where it all started for you. Born in Winona, yeah. but you kind of yeah. moved around a lot early on. Yeah. So how would you frame up that, that early part yeah. of, of your life? You know, uh, a little bit of a nomad, man. Uh, people ask me where I'm from. I'm like, I have no idea. You know what? My family lived in Carrollton. No, no hospital in Carrollton. If you if you guys ever been to Carrollton, you all know that there, there isn't any place. So we had to draw up, drive across the county line into what big, big metropolis of Winona for Tyler Holmes Hospital. But, born there my dad's a pastor so it's kind of like being in the military you know we just moved a lot and so man i've lived uh, carrollton sunflower over in the delta new orleans baton rouge before i was you know five years old and then uh, was in baton rouge for a few years then columbus back to greenville in the delta and then off to college and and so jason it's been been a little bit of a ride so how would you describe your relate because you come from a somewhat big family mm -hmm. so how would you describe your relationship yeah. with your siblings growing up yeah uh, come from a family with, uh, growing up I had three older sisters. When I was 13, my parents had a, uh, an uh-oh, you know, uh, look what happened, uh, <laughs> baby. And so my, my youngest uh, sister is Hope. She's 13 years younger than me. But I grew up with three older sisters. And man, my, my growing up relationship with them was, man, we loved each other and hated each other, you know. <laughs> we, we, would, we would fight and fuss like everybody, but also uh, man just loved each other. And uh, so, man, it was a great great time I, I grew up probably like you grew up like your listeners grew up man uh we thought life was normal mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so that's what it was and so it was just a, just a sweet sweet family so you grew up as a as a pk for yep. those that don't know that's an affectionate term for pastor's kid or yep. preacher's kid yep. do you think that that growing up as a pk do you think maybe there were some early seeds planted that maybe led to Maybe what you're doing now, or did you ever have an yeah. inkling? No, yeah. that's not what I'm going to do. Uh, so, yeah, both parts of that question. No doubt seeds had to be planted. I mean, my, my, my mom and dad, um, very, very spiritual people. Mm -hmm. And so, I man, that's the one thing I love about my parents is, you know, a uh, lot of examples out there, but my parents were what you see is what you get. Man, there was no duplicity. There was no they, one way when they're in public, another way behind closed doors. Man, they were very spiritually centered people in Jesus. And so, yes, that, that impacted my life. Nobody's impacted my life more. Uh, did I ever think I would be a preacher? Uh-uh. I went to college. <laughs> I went to Mississippi State to be an orthodontist. And I uh, th thought, man, you know, look, I I'll, I'll make plenty of money, never be on call. This would be amazing. And really would have done that if uh, in my freshman chemistry class, the guy sitting one row in front of me and one seat over. If he'd have been smarter, we'd have both probably passed <laughs> because he wasn't. Man, I just, I wasn't very studious. And, and just quite honestly, man, wasn't really walking even spiritually at that time. Mm -hmm. A lot of duplicity in my life and man, just wasn't applying myself. And so, you know, that just didn't work out. I just couldn't pass chemistry. And, uh, but God was way ahead of me. And I, I'm thankful, you know, you look back and you just mm -hmm. go, man, God's, God's uh, way smarter than me. Chip Henderson as a child, how would you describe yourself as a child growing up? Uh, probably really spoiled. You know, again, <laughs> I'm uh, look, raised by, you know, four mamas, really three older sisters mm -hmm. and then my mom. Uh, my dad was in, in school when I was a real young kid, so he was gone a lot. Um, but when he was present, very present. Um, but man, I would say I was probably spoiled a lot. Um, and. Um, yeah, I, in some ways, I was probably a Sunday school teacher's nightmare, you know, because I knew knew the Bible stories. I'm like, come on, these things are implanted in me. So, you know, I'd be cutting up in, in Sunday school, and they would ask me a question trying to catch me off guard, and I could just spit it back out, you know. <laughs> so it just sucks for the teacher, you know. I hate it, but that was kind of the way it was. Um, but no, man, very blessed growing mm -hmm. up. Man, been blessed with just a great home. Um, imperfect. Look, everybody's family's got some dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Mine's got some dysfunction, so I, I'm not trying to paint that picture at all. But man, just so blessed. So, so blessed growing up. And um, you know, grew up playing a lot of sports um, as, as a kid. Um, and so God, God blessed me in that, gave me, gave me decent, you know, a, a mind. So, so school came fairly easy. But man, I think just a normal Mississippi, you know, childhood, I would say. You mentioned sports being, yeah. you know, part of your interest growing up. Yeah. But what other interests did you have yeah. when you were growing up? Yeah, uh, growing up, man, basketball, 
football, baseball. That was back before you had to, you know, specialize and play one sport all year long and break <laughs> right. the bank on your parents. You know, you actually had seasons and then a summer where you went to the swimming pool. Uh, loved going swimming, loved playing, you know, bike chase with my, with my friends around the neighborhood. Um, my, my family, I, I grew up hunting, man, and I love the outdoors. That's my passion now. Um, I love I love chasing, you know, back then, you know, primarily doves and deer and mm -hmm. um, go fishing a little bit, you know, but uh, kind of held on to the to the hunting aspect. Now, speaking of the hunting aspect. So your dad was telling me a story about when you killed your first deer yep. around 10 years old. Yep. Do you remember that story? I do. I just gotten out of the hospital, Jason, not like, I don't know if it was, I think that's what it had to have been the day before because we went hunting that next morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad and I back riding on, I was riding on the back of a three-wheeler. Okay, so this is old school, <laughs> man. It's a death trap, dude. You probably remember these things, man. You go around the corner too fast, you're going to flip. Um, but we, we go hunting. He puts me up in this tree that's, you know, just two by fours nailed to the tree. You climb up in it and you sit on this platform. I'm 10 years old. My mom, if she would have known, would have probably killed him. <laughs> DHS would probably take me away from my parents today, you know, for doing that kind of stuff. But uh, I'm sitting there. My dad goes probably another two or 300 yards away from me. And so I'm sitting up there with a, with a rifle. And it started snowing, man. Just snow started falling. I hear some dogs running and they're, they're chasing a, you know, a deer. And I hear my dad shoot, so I know it's a buck. And anyway, long story short is this deer comes by me and I somehow managed to shoot it. And then I uh, jumped out of the, you know, the tree and probably that was a no-no too. But man, me and my dad just celebrated that. And uh, yeah, just a lot of fun. Man, a great memory of me as a little kid holding this six point deer up, you know, <laughs> and uh, all my sister's boyfriends were just totally, you know, <laughs> pissed at me, mad at me because I'm you know, 10 years old killing this deer and they can't do it. So, yeah, great memory. Good bonding moment for oh, you and your dad too. 100%, now. man. Yeah, just learned so much from my dad, you know, and certainly he taught me, you know, preaching in church. But man, mm -hmm. my dad modeled for me, Jason. I'm blessed in that way. And man, just for guys out there listening to us right now. Man, it's, it's awesome what you say to your kids. That's great. They need that. Man, the way you live in front of your kids. Come on. That's the, that's the loudest mm -hmm. message you're teaching right there. Um, and so I was. It was a bonding moment, you know. And, and, and there's, a, there's a couple of traditions around deer hunting. I don't want to gross all your, you know, listeners <laughs> out, you know. But uh, when, you, when a person kills their first deer, you put a little blood on their face. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a tradition. But if a person misses a deer, um, then tradition in hunting camps was you would cut part of their shirt tail off and, you know, put it on the, on the wall at the hunting camp. So uh, my dad says, hey, you want to see where you, uh, I, I made a deal with my dad. I said, look, if you don't put blood on my face, I won't tell anybody you missed. And he's like, deal. And then after we got through you know, kind of cleaning the deer in the woods, he said, you want to see where you hit the deer? I said, yeah. And I leaned over and he just took blood and put it right in my face. And so I reached for my knife and I cut about half his shirt off, <laughs> you know, standing there. <laughs> And come to find out, look, we were, we were real poor. It was probably one of his best shirts, but it didn't matter how whack that thing. Um, but bond, you talk about bonding, man, we mm -hmm. still look back and laugh at that. Your viewers may not find that funny, but it was a great story for us. And yeah, man, I swear, you know, my dad and I were, were connected, you know, was just doing things like that together. And I got to see that his life matched his message. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, I, I, that's invaluable. Was there ever a moment, any hint that kind of led you to think, all right, maybe I'll be a pastor one day. Was there ever anything along the way that maybe gave you some sort of indication, all right, this might be a possibility, yeah. or did that ever happen? You know, it's probably the only thing I, w I could think of is, I don't know if, you know, you guys ever did Youth Sunday mm -hmm. at your church, you know, where they took probably the, um, the least attended Sunday night of the year and gave right. it to the students. And, uh, and I, I led the sermon on a Sunday night when I was a student, you know, in high school. That would be about the only indication where, man, you know, I thought that went okay. I guess that'd be the best way to say that. Mm -hmm. Past that, no thought. And uh, even my journey to, to ultimately sensing this is what God had for me was, man, it was, it was a slow train, a journey of, man, thinking I was going to work with college students, then working with high school kids, and then, you know, um, slowly easing my way into, man, just teaching, you know, on a weekly basis. But no, er, growing up, bro, that wasn't on my radar. Hmm. Washington High School. So I hear you were uh, in high school, pretty good athlete. Uh, playing basketball, playing a little yeah. football. What, yeah. what were the high yeah. school years like for, yeah. for Chip Henderson? Uh, I was a legend in my own mind. <laughs> <laughs> the older I get, the better I was. Right, you know, right. Those your memories worse. No, you know, I'm, I wasn't a great athlete. I was a decent athlete. Um, 
uh, could could do a lot of things fairly fairly well, mm -hmm. um, good hand-eye coordination, and so man, I just loved it. That was an outlet for me. Um, it was a you know probably a place, honestly, Jason, where where I learned leadership. Um, you know, leading guys, honestly, some of them, particularly on the basketball court, when I played uh, public school basketball in Columbus, leading guys who were much much better athletes than me, but just needing someone to speak into them. And so um, that, and then graduated from Washington School in Greenville, and man, it just was a platform for me to make friends and to, and to uh, enjoy life. I loved it, and like I said, you know, it was, uh, I wasn't great, but I was good enough to really have fun and get to play, and most of the time stay, you know, either on the field the whole game or, you know, on the court most of the game unless I got in foul trouble. Uh, or did something stupid. So, uh, but just loved it, man. Loved the camaraderie. I loved the competition. I still have that competitive edge that, man, you know, I, I like to have itched, uh, scratched at times. Um, so, you know, still try to do that through, through the years, you know, running triathlons, different things like that. But just loved, absolutely loved sports and just, I, I think it's valuable. It's not, it's not life, mm -hmm. but it was fun. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. The internet can be a dangerous place. With Connect and Protect from Seaspire, you get the phone you want, and you get the tools to easily track her location, restrict content, and help protect her at any age. It's like a digital mom arm. A what? The thing moms do. I'm not following. How do I put this? Look out! <gasps> oh, mom arm. Got it, yeah. Introducing Connect and Protect from Seaspire. Only $30 a month with free guided setup. Customer inspired, that's Seaspire. The fabric of any community is its people. It's the commitment to hard work and to be our best. It's where you know your neighbor by name. It's where family is important. At Covington County Hospital, we are your family and friends. That's why your healthcare is important to us. From emergency room visits to primary care to behavioral health, we want to make sure that healthcare is available when you need it. Covington County Hospital, where your healthcare matters. Mississippi's farmers love what they do, producing food and products for you and your family to enjoy. But we know this land is not just ours, it's yours too. That's why our farmers maintain this soil, keeping it rich and bountiful. We are sustaining this land so it will be useful to feeding generations to come. Donate at farmfamiliesms.org to help us spread the word or find us on Facebook. The Farm Families of Mississippi, our work fuels the world. Culpepper is going to be watching this. He thinks you're a pretty good athlete. I'm just telling you. I know Culpepper is going to be watching later on. So, what was it about Mississippi State? So, you come out of Washington yeah. School. What was it about State that, that drew you to, as we call it, Start Vegas? What was yeah. it that drew you there? Yeah, uh, probably, honestly, the crowd that went. There, mm -hmm. there was no reason. At the time, I was a big Alabama fan. Okay, uh -huh. so I had no affinity for Mississippi State to say, man, I'm going, I'm a bulldog at heart because I wasn't. I became a State fan because that's where, you know, my family's money went. You know, and that's where I was. And so, I uh, became a state fan during that time, but I uh, really was my friends, you know, and um, I mean, it's true. I say this, I've heard this, I say this, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And man, hmm. my friends impacted my life in that way. And so I wound up at Mississippi State because of, man, one of my best, one of my best friends was going there, had other friends who were going there. And so that's how I found myself there. I, I'm, I'm taking a moment because, I, I mean, I go to Pine Lake, so, I've heard the 
you know, and I enjoy the, the little jabs yeah. at, at Alabama. <laughs> You're already laughing, yeah. you know. So yeah. that shocks me a little bit yeah. to hear that you were an Alabama fan. I know. Well, look, here, here, Jason, here's the deal, man. Pine Lake, we, I, it used to be Ole Miss. It was Ole Miss. Yeah. You know, I would, I would hammer Ole Miss incessantly. Sorry, Rebel fan. <laughs> um, but then we started a campus in Oxford, and Hugh Freeze became a friend, and mm. I had to quit. <laughs> it's bad for attendance if you just keep, keep hammering away. So I had to move on to LSU and Alabama. Mm. Uh, occasionally I'll throw in some Tennessee love or Arkansas. <laughs> You know, just going around SEC West is kind of what I'm doing. I'm still shocked that you're an Alabama fan. Yeah. would have never yeah. guessed well, that. Well, I was an LSU fan because I lived in Baton Rouge. Right. And so we had a member of our church. This woman was, I mean, Momo Evelyn Black. She was, I mean, amazing LSU fan. Go Tigers, everything. She dressed me in purple and gold from the time I was a little bit kid. So I was a Tiger fan. I went with a guy named Joe Gillis to the Alabama LSU game once uh, over in Tuscaloosa. And LSU was up. 28 nothing and a half, and I was giving him business. Bama came back and scored 42 straight, and um, Alabama won, and I became an Alabama fan that day. All right, so I got to ask, why an orthodontist when, when you yeah. get state? So what was it about wanting to be an orthodontist that uh, made you want to be yeah. an orthodontist? I, I think like most people, Jason, going thinking about your future, man, what you'd really like to be is have as much money as you can and have as much freedom as you can. Mm -hmm. And so I, I never, I never, I never wore braces. Nobody in my family ever wore braces. Um, I mean, that's just God's grace because we couldn't afford it braces. Um, but for some reason, I just thought an orthodontist would be a cool job, make plenty of money, and never on call. And that was it. I knew nothing about it past that, honestly. Um, and again, that's just a you know a 17-year-old kid going to college saying, oh yeah, that's what I'll do. But like, mm -hmm. that's, and that's why most college kids change their major five times because they have no idea what they're going to be when they grow up. And most of us grow up and still have no idea what we're going <laughs> to be when we grow up. And that's part of the unfolding of God's plan mm -hmm. too. And so again, that's you know I trust the Lord with that. But it just was a random pick. You'll have to correct me, but I, I remember listening to several of the series and just listening to you over the years and going to church at Pine Lake. And if I remember correctly, you were telling the story about how it was during your time at Mississippi State that God really began to deal with you 100%. and really started to call you. So how would you frame up that experience when God really started to move on your heart oh, yeah. while you were at State? Easy. Uh, Jason, I was, a, I was a freshman in college, spring break, living with a foot in the world and a foot in the church, if you mm -hmm. understand what I'm saying. Man, mm -hmm. I go to church on Sunday, but living like hell Monday through Saturday. Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's this duplicity in me. I wanted to go to the beach for spring break, um, and two things were going for a, a, a trip. There was a trip from Campus Crusade for Christ going to Daytona Beach, Florida. It was cheap, and there was a senior girl named Lisa Stewart from Philadelphia, Mississippi who was going, and I'm like, bam, let's go. Sign me up. So I went, honestly, to get close to her, and it was the cheapest way to go to the beach. And so, and again, and, and I did, there was a spiritual part of me. I did want to know about Christ. Mm -hmm. And it was at that place where God brought me face to face with the with the duality in my life, that inconsistency where I'm talking the game, but man, I'm not living it. And it was there that God showed me, man, it's time for you to either, man, be all in with me or not. And so that was it. And so it began a journey then for me to say, okay, God, you know, I, I, I'm in. I'm starting to grow. I started to read the Word. Some guys were, a guy was pouring into me and then challenged me to start leading a Bible study with some other guys. And so I, I led a Bible study with some guys that I knew, some fraternity brothers, and then uh, kind of grew them through and then got some other guys who were just knuckleheads from the Pike house. I was a Sigma <laughs> guy. They were Pikes. I started pouring into them. A guy named Daniel Boyd, a football player at Mississippi State back in the day. He, mm -hmm. Randy Dye, Spence Blackheart, some of those guys. We did a little Bible study, but something was happening. Guys were responding to that. Got to speak at SCA at Mississippi State. So there, there was just this growing sense that, man, God is he's putting something in me. And so it was just, again, it was a slow journey. Man, it's the, it's the death of your flesh and still is, you know, over time. And so God just peels that onion a little at a time. Thank God he's patient. Mm. Thank God he is gracious and faithful when we're not. But it was just a journey for me. I didn't just pop out and say, man, I'm going to be a preacher. And the next day, you know, you're, you're acting like Billy Graham. That ain't it. Man, it's just, man, I, I'm a dude who just said, all right, God, if you'll have me, here I am, and, and I want you to have all of me, and some days that's better than others, quite honestly. But out of that growth, man, here, here I am. And out of that experience, 
those seeds are planted, yep. they're watered, yep. and eventually you felt like God was calling you to the ministry. And it was a trip home for Thanksgiving. Yeah. You yep. told your parents. Yeah. So yeah. what do you remember about that yeah. conversation? So, so, so that now I'm into my sophomore year. So mm -hmm. this is spring break. It's now eight months or more later. And I'm like, God, you know, I know I'm not going to be an orthodontist because mm -hmm. that dude can't pass chemistry for us. So <laughs> I know I'm not going to, I know I'm not going to be that, but what am I going to be? And so my roommate, God rest his soul, Mike Gallatis was in, um, he, he was in communications and he wasn't going to class either, but he was making good grades. And I said, well, I think I'll just try that. And so I got into communications as a major. Again, God way ahead of me. But as I'm, as I'm beginning to sense that, man, something's happening, man, that there's something in me, maybe I'm supposed to work with college kids. I don't know. God, show me. Give me a sign. You know, surely we've all said that. God, give me a sign. And so I went home that, that Thanksgiving my, for the first time. Only time that whole semester, my dad was preaching on the Jews, asking Jesus for a sign that he really was who he said he was. And Jesus' response was, you don't need a sign. You just need to have faith in what you've already seen. And I took that as my sign. And I told my mom and dad, man, I think God's called me to ministry. And here I am. So when you told your, your mom and dad, I remember your dad telling me, he, he had mixed feelings about what you mm -hmm. had told him simply because, you know, I mean, you know, from, from their life, your life, mm -hmm. traveling around, being a pastor, they had gone through some difficult times, yeah. he and Miss Dorothy, your mother. Yeah. And so he had mixed feelings. He knew that God was going to use you in a big way, but he had mixed feelings. So th did you guys ever discuss that part of it? Yeah, I think the, the one thing I do remember my dad saying to me is, you know, Chip, if God will let you do anything else, go do it. Mm -hmm. And that way he wasn't trying to be mean. He wasn't trying to talk me out of it. Mm -hmm. But what he knew and understood was is that because there's a target on your back from the enemy, because, you know, there's a lot of giving that, that takes place in this journey because men, people are imperfect and hurting and wounded and they can hurt back. And he had experienced that. If you don't have a clear sense that God called you to this, your calling is what sustains you. Mm -hmm. Your calling from God, your commission from God is, the, is many times the only thing that keeps you in the fight. And that's what he was trying to say to me. And, and so, man, honestly, it was the best best advice, most loving parental, you know, advice in terms of pastoring that he could have given me was to make sure that this is God's call, not my call, your call, somebody else's call. This is God's call. I remember him telling me too that the first time that he did hear you preach, he was, he quoted, he said, outstanding. I made wow. sure I wrote it down wow. correctly. Outstanding. Wow. He said Chip was outstanding. And I knew at that moment, God was going to use them in a big way. To hear your dad say that, and for folks in central Mississippi and the state, they know exactly who Pastor yeah. Gene Anderson is, a guy that impacted the state, this community for years. Hearing him say that, yeah. sure, he's your father, but his stature in the community and the state, for him to say that about you, what, what did that moment mean to you? Well, uh, my dad's the best preacher I know, and man, he is the one who modeled for me what it looks like. And yeah. Look, uh, my dad would preach, you know, four sermons in one. I mean, he just that much content, that deep, that much of a Bible teacher. And so, man, for him to, you know, affirm that man, means everything. I mean, your, your father's words anyway would mean that much. And uh, there's a power in a father's words. But for him to affirm that and to genuinely mean that, uh, man, it just, it, it just lets you know, man, I, I think I can do this. So you finish at Mississippi State on to seminary, mm -hmm. and I had heard in another interview or, or somewhere that you said that you were writing a paper on Paul's use of athletic imagery yeah. uh, in the Bible. Do you think that your days of being, as you said, a legend in your own mind, yeah. or being an athlete yeah. and having that love for athletics, do you think that kind of helped you retain it a little better? A thousand percent. Yeah. Um, that was my PhD dissertation topic. Um, it was a topic that had been written on back in 1960, whatever, but hadn't been updated, you know, through the 90s. And so my major professor said, hey, listen, write on something you enjoy. Don't worry about making a contribution to the New Testament field of study. You'll do that later, maybe, if that's your desire. Mm -hmm. And so to, to grind out that kind of work, you, you just have to do something that you love. I loved athletics. And so I said, bam, there you go. And it was. It was, it was enjoyable and easy for me to then defend what I had written about because I loved it. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. It has often been said that home is where the heart is. It's where hardworking and dedicated people form the fabric of a thriving community. 
At Covington County Hospital, it's our priority to help keep our community safe, healthy, and moving. With our primary care clinics and services, we are working to keep you healthy. Because home is where the heart is. Home is where family matters. Covington County Hospital, where your health care matters. It's no secret, our crops and animals need water to grow. Whether it's growing soybeans, corn, cotton, cows, or chickens, farmers use this natural resource every day, just like you do in your homes and at the office. Our promise is to only use what we need to keep producing what you need. Donate at farmfamiliesms.org to help us spread the word or find us on Facebook. The Farm Families of Mississippi, our work fuels the world. Ceasefire's Fiber makes it so easy to make music on my computer. I was on Discord in real time, and it was like that. It was like that. It was exactly like being in the studio. From just the tap of the button, I can just transfer files or send over projects, send over anything. It's just something I don't need to worry about. I'm just like, I have the creative size, and Ceasefire has got the whole internet side. Family owned and operated since 1986, Lakeside Molding has become the trusted source of architectural products throughout the South. They offer fine interior architectural moldings, custom millwork, and cabinet doors designed and handcrafted in Flowood. Their showroom on Lakeland Drive is stocked with today's most sought after interior details, including corbels, posts, fireplace mantles, bath vanities, mirrors, and much more. Tim Shoemaker and his staff work closely to meet client needs for new construction, restoration, and remodeling projects. Lakeside Molding, where details make the difference. Do you ever reflect on the first time that you preached in your first official church in the first official capacity? Were you nervous? Were you excited? Was it a mixture of yeah. both? How yeah. often do you reflect on that moment? Uh, I probably don't reflect as much as I need to. <laughs> uh, I do think back to the first time, you know, I preached at First Baptist Church of Winona, you know, and um, uh, I was nervous. I still get nervous. I'm nervous today. It's a different nervousness. Back then it was nervous standing in front of people talking. Um, now it's a nervousness to say, do I have the word that God has for us today? And that's a different kind of nervousness. Um, but then I just look back at the journey and say, you know, God just has slowly grown me. I look back at some of the, you know, I started to say the CREP, some of the, some of the junk I preached back in the day. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I stood up in front of people. And this is what I told them. You know, it was true, but I just, you know, it's just embarrassing. But look, that's part of life, isn't it? That man, look, you're not where you used to be. You grow. God graciously grows us and mm -hmm. he uses even those days. I mean, he used those days to grow me, to grow other people. And so I'm just thankful. What lessons did you learn in those early years that maybe you still put in practice today? Because, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you learned a lot from that first year to that second year, second year, third year. What lessons did you learn yeah. early on? Yeah, uh, I don't know, some people may not believe this, but I really don't do anything different sermon prep wise today at Pine Lake than I did whenever I was at my first pastor in Tangipahoa, Louisiana, preparing for 22 people. Hmm. The diligence of studying the text letting the text begin to speak and letting the Holy Spirit begin to let the Word talk. Not me saying, hey, this is what I want to preach on. That ain't it. But letting the Word come alive, let the Holy Spirit enliven that Word. Using the training that I got in seminary, that's it. And it's, it, it, it's a skill that can be developed, but it's also a mysterious spiritual thing that I think only it only happens through practice, through learning to hear God's voice, watching what the text is saying, and letting the Word speak. Jason, I, I don't have any power in my words. Mm -hmm. God's Word never comes back void. God's Word sharper than a two-edged sword. And so the goal of a pastor is to take the never-changing Word of God and apply it to ever-changing lives and circumstances. But He can do it. Mm -hmm. And so people come up to me all the time. Man, you've been, you've been bugging my house. I'm like, no, not lately. <laughs> um, <but laughs> I haven't, but the Word of God has. Mm -hmm. and, so, and it is a skill, and I thank God, you know, He's gifted me, and I, and I have to acknowledge that that is a gift. I, I have to steward the gift. Mm -hmm. But it's a gift that He has given me to be able to look at the text and, and hear that and then say, okay, this is what that looks like in Mississippi. This is what it looks like in the, you know, in the life of, you know, dude working at... Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield or St. Dominic's or Merritt Health or 
you know, for the college or college kids. You just reflect back on your experience. How does this word apply? And then you try to bring that to life. That's what my seminary professor taught me is, man, don't be preaching way up here. Ain't nobody going to get that. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to, you need, he, well, his word was, you got to put the food down there where the cow's going to eat it. Man, you, you need to teach to, um, so that kids can understand it. Mm-hmm. That needs to have enough depth that guys like you, folks who, man, have been at this for a long time, uh, are still challenged by. And that's part of the, the challenge and yet the skill of learning over time is mm-hmm. how to do both. You don't ever do both perfectly. You'll never give everything in one message. But over time, over time, a steady diet of the Word of God changes people's lives. So I got to ask, before you came to Pine Lake, did you know anything about them? And what did you know, if anything, before you made that transition? Yeah, I was in Brookhaven, Mississippi, pastor in Fair River Baptist Church. Loved it. Absolutely Mm -hmm. loved it. But my dad was pastoring in the Brandon community, and he had told me about Pine Lake, told me about my predecessor, Tommy Politz. Mm -hmm. And man, my dad really loved the guy. I uh, really loved Tommy, man, loved the, the fact that he had vision for what, what could be in this community. And so what I knew is that, you know, Tommy was a young leader and good things were happening, but that Pine Lake had had a history of, um, man, really being a difficult place to pastor was mm-hmm. what, I, what I heard. So that, that was really it. That was all that I knew. 1999, big year for you. Yeah. You decide to leave a place that meant so much to yeah. you in Brookhaven. Pine Lake had only had, I think, like two pastors uh, prior to, to your arrival in the entire history of the church. Yeah. So you're going to a place that hadn't had a whole lot of change. You're leaving a place that meant so much to you. How difficult was yeah. was that decision process? The, the, the hardest part of, of following the Lord sometimes is leaving people you love. Mm-hmm. And man, I would never have chosen to leave. But Jason, whenever you know that God's telling you this is the way, Mm -hmm. it makes it quite easy um, to know that you're doing what God's telling you to do. And I knew this this journey started probably in August of 98. Mm -hmm. And just in my regular reading of the Word, I was reading through the life of David, probably by the 1st of October, I knew God was telling me that's the place. Now, they hadn't asked me yet. But as that, they started getting more serious about me um, and were calling for you know, interviews, can you come, can you do this? My answer was yes, because I already had a word that, that this was, from my perspective, this was, this was where God was taking me. And so from that perspective, it was not hard, even though I didn't know a thing about it, I knew that God was calling and that was all I needed. It's a little over a year that you're, that you're there and the growth, that you're just experiencing this exponential growth. And then in November 2000, you guys opened what we now know as the Reservoir Campus, yep. beautiful 150-acre campus there. What was it like to you? I've always wanted to ask you this, for you personally, to walk into that building, walk on that campus, whichever one, for, for the first time, yep. knowing that, again, going back to Brookhaven, leaving a place yep. that meant so much to you. Yep but experiencing this incredible growth that, and this journey that God's leading you on, what was it like for you to step into that well, building? Well, so true confessions, right? Uh, we, <laughs> were, we were at uh, Spillway Road campus, one church, one location for the first three or four years that I was there. So, um, and we went from two services to three services to four services to five services a weekend there. So we're in a 600 seat auditorium. I mean, we're just people crammed in. It was crazy and electric. We loved it. When we moved to the new campus in 2003, November, into a 2,200-seat auditorium, it looked like nobody was there. We're rolling around like marbles, and I hated it. (laughs) Absolutely hated it. I I questioned if we had missed God. Did I make a mistake? Was this wrong? And people just didn't show up. People tell me, no, you open the doors, they're coming, and they didn't. Of course, now what I know is, man, people are deer hunting. You know, they're going to to college football. (laughs) Of course, they're not coming. But when we got to the third week of January, people came. And by, mm. we, by the time we got to February, we added another service. And so we went from two services to three services. And, and it was an incredible ride. Um, but that's not, that's not how it started. It started very painfully, quite honest, moving in. Knew that's what God, again, and God confirmed, that's an incredible God story too. Knew that's what God led us to. But, but boy, were there some real question marks those first couple of months. Well, in 06, you open up another campus, yeah. and since then, we're, last time I looked, we're at five campuses. Five campuses. I think mm-hmm. maybe there might be a sixth campus mm-hmm. coming down the mm-hmm. road. Mm-hmm. And now you look at, you're the senior pastor over a multi-campus church across mm-hmm. the state of Mississippi. Do you ever just sit back and be like, 
God, I can't believe that I'm on this journey. Do you ever sit back and kind of take a moment to say, I cannot believe, because yeah. you look at where, going back to those talks at Mississippi State and yeah. growing up, and yeah. now you look at this journey that God's got you on. Do you ever just sit back and go, wow? Oh, yeah, 100%. And just for the record, I thought multi-site would never work in Mississippi. Really? <laughs> Why? I was against it. Just because, man, uh, you know, I thought it would work in a bigger city, yeah. but I just didn't think the pe people of Mississippi would go for it. Um, uh, and I was wrong. I was wrong. To, uh, the way we're doing multi-campus ministry, um, God somehow through His Spirit works in that for sure. And so here's what I would say about that. You know, Jason, there, th this is the way God has just wired me, right or wrong. Um, I try not to think about what's going on because one of two things would happen. If I were to really think about the way God has blessed the Pine Lake family and, and my life in, in the midst of this, Either my head would get real, real big, mm -hmm. or I'd be crushed under the weight of it, and both of those are disasters. And so I just don't think about it. I'm just a dude, man. I love my wife, I love my kids, I love the people in my life, and I love to deer hunt, I love college sports, I love, I love living in Mississippi. And um, man, I'm just telling other people, hey man, I'm a beggar telling other beggars where I found bread, come on, let's go. And uh, man, God's given grace to that. I cannot, nor do I want to think about all the stresses that come with being you, yeah. you know, just, being Pastor Chip Henderson mm -hmm. over all these churches, the responsibilities and everything that, that, that comes with it. So how do you manage the stress and everything that comes with, well, be, being you? Yeah, um, I'd say a couple of things. Jason, number one is, man, uh, I have a personal walk with Jesus mm -hmm. that keeps me grounded. That's everything. That's the, the wellspring from which everything flows. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't change no matter where you are. Secondly, man, I'm married well, and my wife and I have, uh, she's an amazing person, man. Her journey, her story is a whole other thing, but it's our story and, and just our relationship and the way that's grown and matured through the years. Bro, that keeps me grounded and keeps me happy and joyful uh, and is my place of peace is at my house with my wife. And then a great team. There's no way that, you know, a person, you know, you, you can say, hey, Chip, you know, you, you lead Pine Lake. And that is true to a degree. But Jason, this, there, there are literally a hundred people, um, both ministerial staff as well as lay people, a hundred or more. It takes a team to do that. And each of us doing our part in the body or the team, that's how that happens. I play my part. I get it. It's a significant part. Um, but, but I'm not the only part. Man, there are a lot of people. And so that divided weight, man, it just makes the journey manageable. But man, it makes it enjoyable is um, just knowing that, man, we can go, what, what's the saying in sports, you want to go fast, go by yourself, but if you want to go far, go as, get, go as a group. And I think that's true um, in life. I think it's true for you and me. I think it's mm -hmm. true as a church family. Man, you can do a lot by yourself, but you're limited. If you really want to see something happen, man, uh, it's a spiritual principle. You, you empower others to use their God-given gifts. And, and man, you don't diminish a bit. God blesses you, blesses them, and we bless each other. And so that's it, dude. That's the way that happens is, man, just working with the team, great wife, great family, love my kids. And then, man, just my personal time with the Lord sustains me. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. The internet can be a dangerous place. With Connect and Protect from Seaspire, you get the phone you want, and you get the tools to easily track her location, restrict content, and help protect her at any age. It's like a digital mom arm. A what? The thing moms do. I'm not following. How do I put this? <gasps> oh, mom arm. Got it. Yeah. Go. Introducing Connect and Protect from Seaspire. Only thirty dollars a month with free guided setup. Customer inspired. That's Seaspire. The fabric of any community is its people. It's the commitment to hard work and to be our best. It's where you know your neighbor by name. It's where family is important. At Covington County Hospital, we are your family and friends. That's why your healthcare is important to us. From emergency room visits to primary care to behavioral health, we wanna make sure that healthcare is available when you need it. Covington County Hospital, where your healthcare matters.
100 years ago, there were a lot more of us. Today, we're using the latest technology to make sure not one seed, not one drop of water, not one inch of this farm goes to waste. We want to be here for the next generation of Mississippians, ours and yours. Donate at farmfamiliesms.org to help us spread the word or find us on Facebook. The Farm Families of Mississippi, our work fuels the world. Family owned and operated since 1986, Lakeside Molding has become the trusted source of architectural products throughout the South. They offer fine interior architectural moldings, custom millwork, and cabinet doors designed and handcrafted in Flowood. Their showroom on Lakeland Drive is stocked with today's most sought after interior details, including corbels, posts, fireplace mantles, bath vanities, mirrors, and much more. Tim Shoemaker and his staff work closely to meet client needs for new construction, restoration, and remodeling projects. Lakeside Molding, where details make the difference. Ceasefire's Fiber makes it so easy to make music on my computer. I was on Discord in real time, and it was like that. It was like that. It was exactly like being in the studio. From just the tap of the button, I can just transfer files or send over projects, send over anything. It's just something I don't need to worry about. I'm just like, I have the creative side, and Ceasefire has got the whole internet side. You knew my next question. I was going to ask, kind of behind every great man yeah. is a great woman. Yes. You and Chrissy have been together a long time. Yeah. 31 and years. 31 years. Yep. December 15th is 31 years. So this journey that you guys have taken together has just been tremendous. I mean, what's yeah. that meant to you? Yeah. I mean, y'all's relationship. Y'all been through a lot together. Yeah. And yeah. and she's, she's your biggest supporter. Yeah. But what's that meant to you? Well, it's it. Uh, man, it's a journey, and it means everything. You know, um, I'm learning that ministry is to be done. Um, you know, from a from the unity of marriage, and and early on, Jason, I didn't mm -hmm. do that. You know, and it was in some ways, and my, and my marriage has been, we would say, good, mm -hmm. um, but my marriage is moving into that great stage. And that um, early on, we did our life separately together. She had her world, I had my world, and then we had our family world, but. But uh, for those of your listeners who don't know, man, Christy's had a journey with depression since mm -hmm. she was probably seven years old. And that had, you know, seasons of real darkness followed by, you know, let up. But man, it was always there. And then there were some times where uh, just despairing for life. And man, uh, there came a point a couple of years ago where I just told my elders, look, I, I can't be at church. I've got to be with my wife. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point. That was a turning point for us, a turning point for our church, quite honestly, mm -hmm. where... Um, God just did something mm -hmm. and he's brought healing to her. And that's an amazing story, mm -hmm. man. You, you need to have her on one day. Um, but it's been a journey for us and it's not her depression. It was our depression, our journey. And I had my own stuff that I've had to work through and it's opened up a whole new, you know, part of me to understand, man, I've got hurts and, and pains and man, as great as my family was, man, we still had our dysfunction and mm -hmm. there were things that I learned to cope with, strategize around, vows I made, you know, I can't be wrong, I won't show weakness, I've got to win. All these things that were lies, but lies I believed. Mm -hmm. And so, um, man, just, just to watch her lead me and for us to grow together in love, dude, it's, it's, uh, it's great, marriage is better you know, today at 31, and as, as uh, it's kind of a popular saying, man, we want to be better at 70. We want our married life to be better at 70 than it was when we got married uh, in 1990. She has an open invitation, by the way. Yeah. On the show. <laughs> Just watching her share yeah. her story, yeah. it's, it's remarkable, and it's a lot Powerful. of bravery on her part. So you've got kids that have all excelled at doing different mm -hmm. things, and, and parenting nowadays is, you know, so many people get confused mm -hmm. by it. It's such a challenge. What would you say to parents right now that maybe they're still struck, maybe they still got that prodigal yep. son, that prodigal yep. daughter out there, maybe that they haven't come around just yet, they haven't found their way uh, on their journey with God. But what yep. would you say to those parents right yep. now? So number one, never give up. God can do anything. He raises the dead. Man, he can turn anybody's life around. Mm -hmm. uh, he can break those chains. Secondly, I would say start with you. Man, don't, don't ask your child to change before you do. Man, if you want to see God do a deep work in them, let God do a deep work in you. Thirdly, I would say, always love them. You may not always be proud of them, but you can always love them. My dad blessed me with that. 
He said, son, I love you and I'm proud of you and you, never do, you can never do anything to make me not love you. He didn't say you can never do anything to make me not proud of you. I'm sure I have. But love, to love your kids no matter where they are. And, and then I would say to apologize. If you know there are places where you've wounded your kids, own it. And just say, look, I'm, I'm imperfect and I know I've done this and I've hurt you and I'm sorry, but I love you and I'm here for you and I'm never leaving you. And then you pray for them. You pray for them because whenever you pray, God moves. And man, I've just seen it time and again. They may be defenseless. Or they may be able to resist you, but they're defenseless against your prayers. Your preaching style is so unique. I, I so enjoy it because it's so real, raw, mm -hmm. and just and just honest. It's very direct, very practical. Yeah. Is that kind of how you are in everyday life? What you uh, what you see in the pulpit? Hey, I'm gonna be very direct and practical outside the pulpit too. Yeah, I, I think uh, very much so, man. It's just life, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the way we do life, and. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm a practical guy, I, I, and I and I was taught, you know, that man, why, what what good is the word if it's only information? When we, we preach for transformation, we preach for, for God to change our lives, and so that that's what I want to be about. I don't want to just know stuff. I want to I want to be able to to live that out and use it. And so I think my life is is like that. Sometimes my in, in all times, man, our preaching is way ahead of my practice. But mm -hmm. man, I want my practice to catch up. So yeah. I, I want to be as practical, as life oriented as, hey, this, you can actually use this, Jason. God can change your life. Mm -hmm. and, I, and here's how that can happen. Yes, 100%. Man, I, I don't preach for the head. I preach for the heart and for transformation. I got to know what a typical Sunday is like for you from start to yep. finish, from the yep. time you, your feet hit the floor in the yep. morning and uh, you get that first cup of coffee or, yeah. or, what, or yeah. tea or whatever it is, yeah. and until the time your, your head hits the pillow. Yeah. It's, it is a full day. So it's take full. me through a typical yeah. day for you on Sunday. Yeah, it gets, it gets full really before lunch even. So typically I wake up 4.15 a.m. on Sunday mornings, get up, put on my clothes, head to the church, um, make a pot of coffee. And at that point, I'm really editing for content the message, just trying to make sure that that is right and tight and it makes sense logically. So mm -hmm. people ask me, hey, do you ever preach, you know, go preach your sermon in advance? Never. Never do that. Never stand up and preach a message. But I'm preaching it all week in my head. Does this make sense? Could, is there a better way to say this? Is, there, is this the most personal way to say this? Is this the simplest way to say this? That's constant and ongoing. And so I do that until about 7 o'clock. Okay, At 7 a.m., I send the manuscript to all of our campus pastors, all of our production guys. I get in the shower, uh, get cleaned up. About 7.30, go downstairs, get mic'd up, do my do my highlighting, you know, just for my eye catch so I can communicate, you know, like I would be looking at you, mm -hmm. uh, looking up, but I can, I can quickly find myself in my notes if I need to. So it's color coded. Um, for that, 8 a.m. we start service. And from 8 until about 12.45, I'm either preaching in worship or in between services, you know, ministering with people, talking to people, that kind of thing. About 12.45, leave the church, go have lunch, and uh, either at my mama's house, my house, some restaurant, at 2 o'clock, I'm going to bed. And I don't take a nap, bro. I get down to my drawers, and I go to bed. I get under the covers, shut the curtains, I go to bed. And I uh, wake up, you know, a couple of hours later, catch the end of NFL. Uh, you know, this time of year, quite honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the woods a lot of time, man. Go, mm -hmm. go jump in a deer stand that's safe and sleep for, you know, sleep for a few minutes in the stand and then wake up, try to shoot something. But, but that's it. So, uh, but on typical Sunday, man, I'll sleep for a couple of hours, you know, maybe watch a movie or something like that. And then just kind of hang with my family the rest of the day and then back to normal, normal routine. Being well known and a Christian, it's almost like people are waiting for you to say something or do something to mess up. Yeah. Do, do you feel that sometimes in, in your role? Uh, sometimes, but you know, Jason, I, I've tried real hard to just go ahead and let people know, hey, it, you ain't got to look real hard to see me screw up because I do it all the time. <laughs> so don't be shocked, you know, because I'm fully capable and I do. And I try to be honest about that. My, one of my preaching mentors told me, you know, if you get yourself up on a pedestal, People will love you from a distance for a little while, but they'll, they'll watch you fall. Mm -hmm. But if you'll stay off that pedestal, man, people will love you up close for a long time. And that resonated with me. I, I get it. I get my position. But I'm not all that. Dude, I'm telling you, I'm just a normal guy. Um, that God's using me in an extraordinary way. I get it. Um, but I, but I, I think people in my generation, my dad's generation would never share weaknesses. Mm. Um, because that, w that went with the deal and people expected that out of the preacher. And that was an unbelievable weight for preachers back then to carry because ain't nobody perfect 
I think this generation, actually, the more I share about my own struggles and my own journey, mm -hmm. um, I think it actually draws people in because they're saying, hey, me too. And mm -hmm. so I think that's it. So if we go hop in the, this is one of their favorite questions, the Warren Brothers here producing the show. If we hop in your car, your truck, what are we listening to? Yeah. Uh, everybody's got everybody's podcast, yeah. music, go to Sirius. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what yeah. are we listening to if we get yeah. in your car right now? Right now, if you got into my truck, it would, it would pick up with a podcast I was listening to on uh, Emotionally Healthy Leadership from Pete Scazzaro. I also listen to a podcast called The Place We Find Ourselves with Adam Young, Allender Center. Those really are about emotional health and leadership health. Um, that's in a different lane than anything I've, I've, I was uh, raised knowing. Um, man, if I, if I put on Pandora, it's either going to be Luke Combs Radio uh, or, you know, I'll have Elevation Worship and I'll bounce mm -hmm. back and forth depending on, you know, the mood I'm in. So that, that's kind of it as far as music and, and podcast. And, man, you'll find a lot of camo and stuff like that in my <laughs> truck, too. A lot of mud right now. So what do you like at home? I, I'm just curious yeah. when you're at home, with, not a Sunday, but just yeah. when you're at home, you know, with Christy and your kids are just hanging out with friends. What, mm -hmm. What's Chip like at home? Yeah. What do you like? Well, you probably better ask them that. But I <laughs> think this is what I'm like. And again, depending on seasons of life, Jason, sometimes I can be preoccupied and not mm -hmm. present. I'm just being honest. If the closer we get to Sunday, the, the less present I am, the more preoccupied. When things are weighty at work, I tend to be that way. But normally, man, look, I'm, I'm wearing sweatpants or, you know, whatever, just like you are, man. I mean, we'll go throw some chicken on the grill like anybody else. I'll go shoot my bow or we'll watch NFL or, you know, we'll hang out and watch a movie at night. We love to do that. So we're a lot like you. We're trying to find the next best Netflix series to watch, you know, or <laughs> something like that. So it's really not all that different. We love to sit on our porch, my wife and I. And our kids now at this point, they're grown 25, 22, and 19. Man, we love to sit on our porch and talk and just, man, connect. And my wife's a great question asker. And so it's great. It's painful sometimes to have to answer those questions, but it, it just gets you past surface level crap that you're going to talk about, you know, weather, sports, whatever. You know, she really talks about deeper stuff. And so, man, that, that's just kind of it. We're just normal people hanging out. Speaking of deeper topics, so when... You were growing up, I were, I'm growing up. We, we hear this, depending on the time that we're in in this world, are we closer now than ever to the Lord's return? How, how close are we? Oh, dude, uh, the answer is obviously yes, mm -hmm. we're closer. Um, and the truth is Jesus didn't want you to know when. Mm -hmm. And uh, you ain't really on the planning team for when. <laughs> you need to be on the welcoming team. <laughs> right? You feel me? Right? You ain't on the planning team, you don't know when. And that's what Jesus said, you just be ready. And that's the thing that I would say that, man, my, my desire is to help you, to help, uh, you know, the brothers here, to help your, your listeners. Mm -hmm. um, man, Jesus could come for us at any minute. I had a dear, dear friend who's uh, killed in a plane crash over the weekend in South America doing some incredibly good work mm -hmm. like that. You don't know. And so, man, that's my heart is to say, uh, live prepared. Clearly, when you look around, signs are being fulfilled. Jesus could come at any minute and wouldn't have to explain anything to anybody. And so I think that's what we got to do. We got to live with our eyes on, on, on the horizon, knowing that he could come, but trying to bring his kingdom here every day as much as we can by the power of the Spirit in us. Final question. What would Chip Henderson growing up, in parts of Mississippi, mm -hmm. Louisiana, moving around all, all across the South, what would young Chip Henderson think about everything, this journey that God's led you on now, what, what do you think he would think about this? Wow, um, man, I think it'd be overwhelming, honestly, Jason, to go back to my, you know, eight-year-old self, 13-year-old self, man, I think it would be a little bit overwhelming, maybe be exciting, mm -hmm. but at the same time, man, if you told me, hey, this is what you're gonna be doing, I think it'd be overwhelming. Uh, I'd really rather go from my 54-year-old self and look back at my 12, 10 year old self and say, hey man, love Jesus, and love people. Mm -hmm. That's what's really gonna matter in the long run. Look, I, I've wanted to do this for, for a long time. I've wanted to have you as a guest on our show. I can't thank you enough for making time yeah, for us and, and telling your story. I thank hope we you. get to do it again. Thank you, absolutely. Loved it, Jason, thank you so much. I did an interview a couple of weeks ago with a guy's a part of a little local program he does. And in, in the flow of the program, he asked me this question, do you think we're closer now to the return of Christ than we've ever been? So I think he's asking what sometimes you wonder, man, you look around you and you see all the mess and you wonder, man, is Jesus coming back? Y'all, I think, yeah.
Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for another episode of Audibles with Jason Scarborough.